Oh, okay. okay. So if you look at the reaction, there is two things. One thumbs up and raise your hand. So you can do a thumbs up if you're an undergrad. Okay. We can do a thumbs up. Reactions. Yeah. <coughs> Works. Cool. I see a few undergrads. There may be more who join. Cool. I was just curious because um, I hope I'll say something a little bit about undergrads later, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. So I have a couple of announcements and then I think we can start. So okay. <laughs> the announcement is like, uh, okay, if you are interested in attending this, so I have posted uh, some announcement in the chat. You can look at if you are interested in attendances, attending these sessions, please subscribe to the mailing list. Link is given there. The recording of the talk will be available. So the link where the YouTube list is there, you can refer that. And if you are interested or you someone who want to give a talk and all, you can always contact us. So the two email ID is given and in general, like after the talk and even in general about the logistics of the talk, you can give a feedback. So I've created a feedback form. Uh, you can use that. And now I hand over to Pranav to introduce our speaker and I'm happy to uh, listen to you in this today. So Pranav, you can take over. Okay, Good. great. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm uh, Banav, and today we will be having Eunice John from the University of Washington Interactive Data Lab give a talk about her work with T. And I think we are ready to start. Thank you, Eunice, for coming. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really glad that we can connect and I can be here with you all via Zoom. Um, the University of Utah is a very special place to me. It's where I did my first uh, summer of undergrad research in computer science. So I'm glad to be kind of like virtually back or connected with you all. Um, I hope that the central message that you'll take away from my talk is that working in data science and in particular in doing research and in building tools for data science not only involves but often requires an interdisciplinary approach. So in this lens, I'll be talking about T as a case study. And for undergrads, I highly encourage you to continue to explore and combine your interests and their combinations may uh, turn out to surprise you. Uh, also, just for uh, mention of talk logistics, I'm happy to answer questions as they come up. So feel free to raise your hand or add something to the chat uh, window. Yeah. Don't forget to unmute when you ask something. So. Oh, yes. Great. <laughs> Great reminder. <I'm> back. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I'm passionate about democratizing data science by, uh, by building tools that lower the barrier to statistical data analysis. So today I'm excited to talk to you about one such tool, T. Um, but before I dive into that, I'll talk to you a little bit about who I am, um, talk a lot about T, and then touch on a few research projects at the University of Washington. So I'm Eunice. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student in the computer science department at the University of Washington. Um, my advisors are Jeffrey Hare and Renee Just. Uh, Jeff works in human computer interaction or HCI and data visualization and Renee does research in programming languages and software engineering. So my research interests are a mixture of HCI, programming languages and software engineering and I use these approaches to reimagine the stack of data analysis tools that we have available to us. So in particular I develop new languages and interfaces for analyzing data. Um, to do this I focus on designing for people who come from diverse backgrounds not necessarily just statistics. So who might these people be? I often think about kind of three major groups of users. The first being domain experts. These include social scientists or us as computer scientists. So people whose primary training isn't in statistics, but may use statistics to help with their own research in their primary domain. The second group of people I think about are people like education researchers who build tools and platforms to enable non statistical experts to kind of glean those insights and incorporate them into their practice. So for instance, um, education researchers often will build sort of online experimentation platforms to help teachers better understand strategies for teaching that improve um, online learning. Right. And so these education researchers need to provide some support for data analysis um, for these teachers who will make sense of these strategies. 
The third major group I think about are these are kind of people who don't necessarily do data analysis every day, but do it from time to time. Um, so these include like nonprofit directors or grant writers or maybe even policymakers who are interested in analyzing data um, to see how their policies or programs are affecting some population. So we'll come back to and touch upon like the Caesar group in a little bit. But I just want to emphasize here that it's often the case that by making things easier for non experts, we also make things easier for experts. So I'm really lucky that I get to do this work with my advisors, Jeff and Renee, um, but I have also had many other mentors and collaborators outside of the University of Washington, primarily my internship mentors at Microsoft Research. So I've been fortunate to intern there for two summers um, and work with two different groups, but the programming languages group and a human computer interaction group. So in fact, this is the cartoon I used to kind of just introduce myself and say hello to everyone in the lab um, my second summer there. Uh, so now I'm going to transition into and talk about T. Uh, T was initially published and presented at the ACM User Interface Software and Technology Conference, which is a premier conference for technical HCI research. Before I get into the details of T, though, I want to take a step back, back and ask, why do we need statistics and what makes doing statistics difficult? So often we want to learn about facts about a population, but can only obtain data from a subset of that population. For example, we, we might want to know facts about all human beings on Earth, but it's impossible to collect data from all 7 billion people. So realistically, we can only get data from a much smaller sample. We might want to know facts like the average height or the differences of lifespans between countries, and we can calculate these properties about our sample and then make inferences about the population of interest. So in order to be confident that our observations and conclusions aren't just due to chance, we need to first make sure that our samples are representative of that population and also use robust and accurate statistical analyses and methods. So in this talk, I'm focused on that second task of using robust and accurate statistical analyses. So what might make statistics difficult, you will ask? So let's kind of dive into a few of the common kinds of oops, uh, posts I see on social media asking for help about statistics. So there are always several kinds of questions and confessions I come across when I'm looking through Reddit or uh, Stack Overflow. So people will often ask things like, what's the best way to analyze my data set? And confess, I'm not sure what stats test I should be using. So which statistical test should I use? And perhaps most desperately, I'll see people confess, can I do anything with this data? So without a doubt, it's clear that statistics is hard. Researchers and data enthusiasts alike are desperate to make sense of their data, but figuring out which statistical methods and tests to conduct is particularly challenging. So to bring this a little bit closer to home, let's what do you, uh, I have a question. So what do you mean yeah. by test, statistical test? Uh, mm -hmm. So statistical tests, uh, uh, it become a little bit clear in a moment, but these okay. are kinds of like a well known tests might be like your uh, analysis of variance or various like stu um, students t tests to kind of understand um, differences between means or distributions between two samples okay. or population. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. yeah, great question. Are there any other questions at this point. Okay, I'll just move on then. So yeah, so to bring this uh, example kind of a little closer to home, let's say we were curious to see how caffeination affects the number of questions asked at a Utah data science club talk. So we might have an experiment where we have two groups of participants drink different amounts of coffee and we compare the number of questions asked. So once we have that data, we need to select a correct statistical test uh, to determine if any relationship between caffeine consumption and question asking isn't just due to chance. So as another example, let's imagine I take you out to lunch virtually, of course, and I want to know if you can taste the difference in how your tea is made and if it's made with milk poured in before the tea or more milk poured in after the tea. So let's say I give you eight cups of tea and I ask you to identify which of the four have been made in the same way. So to know that your answers aren't just due to chance and that you can indeed reliably distinguish between the two ways your tea was made, I would conduct a statistical test. So for those of you who've maybe taken an introduction to stats course or taken statistics in a variety of different domains, um, this question is perhaps most directly uh, directed at you. So which statistical test should I use? 
So if you have an idea, you can nod to yourself or just kind of think about it for a second. So then what if in this, among this list of common statistical tests used in the social sciences and in computer science, I asked you, which test should you use? So it's still a pretty hard question, but there is a correct answer. Uh, the answer here is Fisher's exact test. And in fact, the exact experiment I just described with tea and milk is the experiment that Ronald Fisher conducted, and this is the experiment that motivated his development of the Fisher's exact test. There's a really interesting book that talks about this anecdote and the history of modern statistics. And so in honor of T and its importance to statistics, we named our system T. T allows users to write and specify the things that are easy to them and automates the hard part. So you might be asking yourself, like, do we really need another language or tool for data analysis? We already have R and Python, but aren't they enough? So to further motivate T, let me illustrate a common workflow we've observed data scientists and researchers follow. So data scientists and researchers often want to start with a research question and want to arrive at a set of conclusions that answer those exact questions. So to do so, we have to then collect some data, which often involves designing studies. And then after collecting that data, we have to identify the appropriate statistical hypotheses such as do we care about differences in means or shifts in distributions that help us answer the original research question. Uh, choosing a statistical hypothesis also involves choosing an appropriate statistical test, which then involves selecting an API or specific implementation of that test to use. So upon executing a statistical test and then getting those results, we then have to contextualize those outcomes to arrive at our conclusions. So throughout this entire long process, it's the end user who must keep track of their decisions, their rationale, and all other information at each step. And that's because although researchers and data scientists think, write about, and discuss research questions and conclusions drawn from data at a very high level, the tools we all have available are low level. So current tools require the end user to select and execute the appropriate low level API calls, such as the one on the bottom right. So current tools provide some support for interpreting the results of statistical tests, but provide little to no support for translating the higher level research questions and study designs into low level statistical function calls. So this process is entirely left up to the user. So even if the user does come from a statistical background, they may end up selecting an incorrect statistical test, which can then lead to wrong conclusions. So T aims to offload some of the cognitive burden of data analysis to the system and bridge this gap from high level questions to low level function calls. T bridges this gap by raising the, bar of, uh, raising the level of abstraction. So T provides a high level interface for expressing research questions and study designs directly and then abstracts away the error prone test selection and execution process. So T is a high level language um, T infers and executes valid statistical tests based on the user's study designs, hypotheses, and data properties, and provides precise output that contextualizes the statistical results to the specific study designs. In our initial evaluation, we also found that T replicates and even improves upon expert choices and prevents common mistakes. T is designed for domain experts who aren't statisticians, just as we talked about previously. And this would include most of us here who are maybe computer science researchers or students and other empiricists who are not in statistics but are comfortable with study design and minimal programming. So T helps such domain experts conduct valid, replicable um, statistical analyses. So for the rest of this portion of the talk on T, I'll show you how to use T, how it works, and the results from our initial evaluation. So let's dive into writing a T program together. T is a high-level language that's implemented as an open source Python package. Uh, T can be installed from pip, a popular Python package manager, and can be imported as a library when writing programs in computational notebooks or wherever you might be writing progr uh, Python programs. Um, a T program is comprised of five parts, um, which we'll dive into in just a moment. Upon executing a T program, T produces outputs such as the following on the right hand side. Uh, the output for each valid test includes two key pieces of information, an explanation of why that test was a valid choice, 
and then any additional information, such as the effect size, to contextualize the results for accurate interpretation. So T currently supports a null hypothesis significance testing module that contains statistical tests that are most common in human computer interaction and software engineering research. If no test applies, T defaults to bootstrapping medians and confidence intervals. Critically, this means that T will always execute and output results from a valid statistical test. So here's a sample T program from our evaluation where a researcher wants to know how imprisonment probabilities differ across different regions in the US. So there are five parts to a T program, data, variables, study design, assumptions, and hypothesis. And I've highlighted the portions of the program here and labeled each with different colors just for ease of differentiation. What's important to notice here is that the user does not have to specify a statistical test. Instead, users provide high-level declarations about the following. The first part of a T program is the data. The T requires the data to be in a CSV file. The second part of a T program is the variables. Variables have name and type information. So here, there are two variables called Southern and probability. Southern has a nominal or discrete type and probability has a ratio type. When I mean type, here, I'm not referring to strings, floats, or ints, but rather um, types that are more specific to the domain of data analysis. So here, you'll see that Southern is a nominal variable, where no means that the state is not from the South, and yes means the state is from the South. Probability is a ratio variable for the probability of imprisonment. The third part of a T program is the study design, and users can specify an observational study or experiment contributor or independent variables, and outcome or dependent variables. The fourth clause is an optional assumptions clause. Uh, users can optionally specify any statistical or data properties that they're willing to accept or know based on prior knowledge. So this user here knew that the probabilities of imprisonment in southern and non-southern states were normally distributed and wanted to have a global type 1 error rate of, or a significance threshold of 0.05. Uh, without an, an optional assumptions clause, T will default to using 0.05 as a significance threshold. So finally, uh, users must also specify a hypothesis. So here, the researcher hypothesizes that there's a relationship between Southern and uh, probability. And in particular, the researcher hypothesizes that Southern states have higher imprisonment probabilities than non-Southern states. So zooming back out, here are all the five pieces of a T program taken together. Can you emphasize more on the study design? I, I didn't get it. What is there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So study design refers to how that data was collected. So um, for ex example, um, if I were to conduct an experiment, like the coffee experiment I showed you, right? I would specify the study type as an experiment where I randomly assigned the participants to either get okay. one cup of coffee or three or more. Okay. Um, other times, um, what's more, maybe more common in computer science are observational studies. So I've collected a bunch of trace data, or I have a bunch of kind of data I scraped off the web type thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another example of an experiment that might be a little bit more familiar is um, like a lot of websites and companies will do like A/B testing, right? Yes. So they'll have two different maybe colors on their website, and they want to see do users click if it's color A versus color B. And so what you would do there right, is specify the study type is an experiment the independent or contributor variable is color, and then the outcome variable is click-through rate. Okay, so it's basically a metadata about how data is generated in the first place. Exactly. Or, okay. Yeah, great question. Okay. Were there any other kind of questions about the five parts? Okay, so I'm just gonna move on. Uh, so yeah, so here are the five parts of a T program. And so now let's take a quick peek into how T works. I have more technical detail about this at the end of the talk um, as extra slides. So if anyone's interested, I'm happy to dive into that later. Uh, so a T program's first checked for completeness, uh, correct syntax, and well-formed hypotheses. And hypotheses are well-formed if they satisfy one of the templates um, shown here. So nominal and ordinal categories, so like discrete categories, can be compared to one another. And then ordinal, ratio, and interval variables can have positive or negative linear relationships with one another. 
So fundamentally, a T program must then go from a set of high-level user declarations to a set of valid statistical tests, which then get executed in the results output. So how does this test selection process work? T compiles a T program into a set of constraints and formulates test selection as a constraint satisfaction problem. So what are constraints? Constraints or requirements for a statistical test are derived from the user written T program and generated from the statistical tests that are part of T's knowledge base. So as an example, let's look at the student's T test. In this program, we know that there are exactly two groups, southern states and non-southern states, and the user has assumed that groups are normally distributed. So T verifies that these two constraints and many others um, hold true for the student's T test. If all of the constraints hold, then we can say that the student's T test is applicable. If, however, any one of these constraints does not hold, the student's T test does not um, apply and it's not applicable. So in other, way, in other words, the applicability of a statistical test is the conjunction of all of its constraints. A natural question here might just be, where do these constraints come from and why do we wanna use constraints at all? So the reason's very simple. So statistical tests already make a set of assumptions about the data types and properties that must be respected in order for a test to apply. So this knowledge is often represented in tables and flowcharts in statistical textbooks or stack overflow posts, such as this one. So in T, we just codify these assumptions as constraints. Uh, there are many benefits of articulating test selection as a constraint satisfaction problem. And I'll just highlight two here. The first is the sensibility. So it's easy to add a new statistical test using the assumptions already in T's knowledge base. So using a constraint formulation, we were able to support double the number of statistical tests than prior systems for automated statistical analysis. A second key reason for using constraints is for flexibility. Oops, uh, for flexibility. Uh, not all properties of data, such as normality, are equally important in all cases. And so by using T's formulation, we can give more or less weight to different constraints and weighing these different constraints against one another mimic statisticians' decision-making and thought processes when they try to figure out which statistical properties and tests are most important for particular contexts. So now that we've seen how T works, I'll touch on the results of our initial evaluation. So in the first part of our initial evaluation of T, we compare the statistical tests experts chose with ones T recommended. We took 12 tutorials from two popular R textbooks and implemented them as T programs based on the code examples. So all assumptions the authors made and explicitly stated in the tutorials were also added as assumptions to the T program in the assumptions clause. So in, uh, in nine out of the 12 cases, uh, T selects the same test. In the other three cases, T selects a more conservative alternative. For these three cases, T found that the choices experts made were not applicable Given, that, um, given the author's explicitly stated assumptions and about the data properties in the text. In the second part of our evaluation, we compared T's test selection to a simulation of what novices might do. So most statistical APIs only do very minimal checking on the applicability of statistical tests. So as long as the data are the right types, and when I say type here, I'm meaning floats and ints, APIs will execute and provide output to the user, even if a statistical test violates the study design. So to simulate what novices might do in choosing the tests, we took the data sets of the 12 tutorials and identified the set of tests that would execute using popular Python libraries. We also took the same data and experimental design information and found, uh, found the tutorials and to see what t tests T would recommend. Uh, hi, I have a question, sorry. So how do you determine which statistical tests the APIs chose? Uh, for the uh, popular Python libraries, you're asking? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we had a script where we took all of the data and then all of the possible statistical tests from these libraries and see, uh, tried all of them and see which ones provided output. So then we had a count for the ones tried and the ones that provided output and succeeded. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, 
So yeah, we found that T recommends a much smaller subset of the statistical tests than current libraries. So as a result, T actually avoids uh, uh, incorrect test selection, uh, common mistakes, and even false conclusions people might draw just based on statistical significance. I have, so, a, related, mm -hmm. uh, I have yeah. a related question. So uh, first of all, T can provide more than one test for a given scenario. Like right. if, like, like out of 10 set, two are applicable given the assumption mm -hmm. and the uh, study design given to us, then yeah. it can provide two things. And in this, you are just checking uh, like just the data type is there, how many tests can we do and what does any test just apply and give us the output? Like if somebody just trying right. randomly any of these. Ones. Okay. Right, right. Um, and the motivation behind that was that um, from our observations, both in teaching um, uh, data analysis courses, um, as well as just from uh, collaborations and observations of other data scientists, we found that people often do do this like trial and error process, right? They'll just see like, what happens if I run this function? And they'll get some output. Um, even if that function, like that statistical test, should never have been applied on that data set. Yeah, I think the knowledge of the assumptions and all those things are hidden somehow. So people don't have that. So, and that's why the, the whole, the complete picture is not shown to us or is even if shown to us, it's highly hard to analyze. Or, yeah, are you saying like current API hide away those assumptions? Yes. yes. Yeah, exactly. So kind of like the key, one of the key kind of design considerations for T, right? Is like, how can we make these assumptions um, more obvious and uh, people at the forefront of what people think about when realizing kind of what their analyses, res analytical results are and in interpreting them? Interesting. Yeah. Um, any more questions about the initial evaluation? Uh, yeah, I have one other quick question. So based on what Vivek said, does T select one test or can it come up with two like valid tests and produce the results? So how does it select like one final test like output the result to the user? Yeah, so T will um, provi provide a number of statistical tests that are valid to the end oh, user. Okay. And does it like output all of the tests back mm -hmm. in the final result? Yeah, so for each test, um, the results will include sort of an explanation of why that test was considered to be valid, often having to do with various properties of the data and the study design, and then um, the results of actually executing that statistical test. Okay, cool. And one of the motivations for kind of designing T in that way was that from our conversations with um, researchers and other kinds of um, researchers in the social, the social sciences, as well as um, a variety of other domains, um, is that even when they do know what statistical tests to conduct, they will often conduct multiple related tests, either that have um, more or fewer assumptions about the data, just so that they can be confident that whatever conclusion they're drawing is in fact validated by more than one test. Um, and it's often the case that if it's not validated by multiple tests, then sometimes that um, provides people with an insight into uh, maybe their data quality issues that make these assumptions uh, true, but the results different than another test, et cetera. Yeah. It might be interesting. This is the same as like we use multiple evaluation metric because all of yeah. them are valid and some like precision give one idea of, and recall give one idea about coverage. Precision give correctness, idea about correctness. Yeah, the exactly. Same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, we can talk about this uh, at the end, but I think there's opportunity to consider kind of which of these metrics would be the most helpful depending on the specific context, whether it's the domain or whether it's like I'm trying to make a causal inference about something. Like, can I, can T maybe uh, support more um, like rank, better ranked? Yeah, like ranking of the this. Yeah. So right now we use a very rough heuristic for statistical power. Um, but it's not um, pretty, it's not, I would say, we haven't done enough like research um, into if that's even useful and it's not like a super um, robust method either. Um, so like, if we were to continually add more and more tests to T's knowledge base, right? Like how do we accurately compare these tests if they might be testing something of a different nature? So. Oh, hi, I have one question here. Hi, Ashwarya. Yeah, hi. hi. Um, so, so far I have seen that all the statistical tests are about hypothesis between an outcome variable and a dependent variable. Mm -hmm. uh, does T also support hypothesis regarding the distribution of the two samples? Yeah, so um, 
often the distributions you're talking about sort of, I think there are two ways that I'm interpreting your uh, question. So are you thinking about sort of if I have one data set that shows my distribution for population A and then I have another data set, can we compare these two data sets? Um, no, so it's more likely like if I have two samples, then can I say that these two samples are generated from the same distribution or not? Uh, I see. Okay, so some of the statistical tests here, um, that is exactly what they are testing, right? Uh, basically, with what confidence can we say that these come from the same or two different distributions? And so in that case, um, as long as uh, you can express what, what kind of factor differentiates these samples, so just like a label maybe, right, then you can kind of provide that information to a T program. So what will be the suitable test in this case for T here? Like which test is it going to perform? for finding the statistics? Yeah, so sometimes we're looking at distributions and to see if they're from the same or different one, people will use a man whitney u test, right? And that's the one that T would uh, recommend. Uh, I see, okay, thanks. Yeah, I think you raise an interesting question though of like, um, what if, uh, I don't know how to articulate, right? That I'm sort of, my hypothesis is different than maybe the hypothesis templates shown here. Uh, and I yeah. think that provide, yeah, and I think that's, a, that's an ongoing um, place of work that I've continued to kind of do research in is like, how do we provide more expressive and kind of a more complete hypotheses that do allow for people to express basically the same thing in all of these kind of multiple ways. Um, yeah, and even if we don't make any assumption about the underlying distribution, then it becomes more interesting. So if we say that even if we don't know what will be the underlying distribution, whether it is Gaussian or... or uniform mm -hmm. we just don't know and we still want to know whether the two distributions are same or not right exactly yeah yeah thanks yeah thank you um so i'll have i'll pause a little bit at the end of this uh, portion for tea um, to take more questions but i'll just move on for now so um just as i kind of mentioned um just given like the initial promise of tea we've continued further development and research with tea and our thinking about tea has kind of evolved has evolved and we um, see T um, as a way to, uh, as a step towards democratizing data science in two ways. So first, T lowers the barrier to statistical analysis for a group of users whose current tools aren't designed for them. Um, so extending work in HCI and other areas of computer science that aim to support novices and automate statistical analysis, uh, T provides this new point in this design space for bringing together a higher level of abstraction with automated test selection by formulating this process as a constraint satisfaction problem. Um, second, T moves us kind of towards reimagining what the ecosystem of tools we have available for data analysis. So as data science and data analysis becomes a much more common task for people in all domains, we have this really exciting and new opportunity um, a need to redesign the programming tools and environments for data analysis, especially for this growing uh, body of users who come from non-traditional statistics and programming backgrounds. So one promising direction um, is to support this entire data life cycle from data collection to sampling to statistical analysis to reporting. And one kind of uh, step along that way that we're, uh, that we're excited to potentially see the uh, usage of T and is um, to use T for uh, programs for pre-registration. So T programs are advantageous to current methods of pre-registration because they enforce a consistent syntax and semantics and then have hypotheses and study designs that can be cross-checked and verified and then can be easily executed once data are collected. So in domains such as psychology and biology, pre-registration is a very common um, practice now where uh, researchers must say what they're going to do in their experiments and what they're going to analyze in order to kind of increase the transparency and the reproducibility of these findings. And so if we think about maybe having a more formal representation, right, of these kinds of intents um, uh, for data collection and analysis, then maybe T programs have this space as an intermediate representation for that. So um, with that, I just want to reiterate that T is open source um, and available on PIP. And now I'm happy to answer any questions about T before moving on to talking about some projects uh, at the University of Washington. Uh, hi, so I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, do you plan to have like a visual user interface for T? So like, do you think it could be possibly compatible with like D3 or with like Vega or Vega Lite? Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? 
Uh, no, that was it. Okay, yeah, great question. Yes, so um, building a TUI is something I've been sort of kind of uh, working on and hacking on um, for the past several weeks. Um, and something that we are kind of looking into with respect to visualization is both in the communication of statistical results, um, as well as in like the elicitation of these assumptions, right? Um, so Prana uh, mentioned a couple of libraries that uh, my other lab mates at UW have created called Vega and Vega Lite, which are basically um, high level like declarative languages for specifying interactive data visualizations. So there seems to be kind of a parallel, right, in the data visualizations that we want to create to communicate statistical insights and the actual analyses that need to be done. And so we've, um, I've been working on uh, the user interface and been mentoring an undergrad in developing more outcome, uh, or, uh, more visual perhaps and interactive output, um, but nothing is like sort of public yet. Um, I'm happy to talk about it more at some other point though, if you wanna talk about it offline. And uh, what was your inspiration for creating the language? Was there like a situation that like you wanted to create T for or something? Yeah, that's a great question. Like the story behind the project, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say there were, there was one anecdote that definitely kind of sticks in my mind. Um, there are a few kind of experiences um, in kind of teaching statistical analysis as well as taking classes in it that influenced T as well. But the one anecdote that stands out um, is that I was working with a few collaborators, all of whom are from like different areas of computer science. Um, and we were collaborating on a project um, where we had collected a bunch of data, like all kinds of data, like whether it's sensor data or like online data or whatever. And we were trying to kind of build models for the user's end user behavior. And um, everyone would kind of turn to me to figure out like which statistical tests we should do because I had the most experience with empirical design and like statistical modeling. And um, this one afternoon, one of my collaborators just emails me um, um, the R script and the output. So just literally copies and pastes whatever like, was output from his console um, with no subject and like no other context or information, right? And so then I'm I presented with this code and this output and I'm like, I don't even know what this data set is or what these variables are. But like I could tell that like, he was trying to ask me, like, is this the right thing to do? So then later I followed up and we clarified a few things. But that particular kind of experience of like, why are we communicating statistical analyses um, via no subject, no context emails, right? Like that seems so kind of archaic in some ways. Um, and so it kind of got me thinking about what are like ways in which we can better represent what we do know about analyses and what we're questioning, right? And in that particular case, my collaborator was saying like, he knows these things about the study, like we did the study together, but he doesn't know which test he should do. Should he use A or B or maybe not, or, or maybe neither. Um, and so that was sort of like threads of that experience. I think you can see in my, the development and design of T. Cool. I was yeah. one, wondering that can this tool be used to even verify some existing studies, like whether they are making sense or they are just like done some anyway, this is just <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, many of the statistical correlation which appear in news are <laughs> really not believable. So I think these tools can be used to basically verify that what they have done is making sense or overall the system is flat. Anyway, yeah. just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, just to kind of add to that comment, um, I, I, we have done that, like just random articles we've seen um, from like various organizations, uh, whether it's about like computer science or health or like, I don't know, I forget the last, the most interesting one was probably just around like demographics of various institutions or something that we did, um, or even like run times for systems. Um, and there, it is interesting because like, I think the, we found that the greatest kind of hindrance is like access to data. Um, so like, if we do have the data set, then we can verify that. But sometimes in the instances where we want to verify, uh, we yeah. can't find the original data set. And it's, yes. it's hard to synthesize a data set just from what's reported, you know? Yes, even the study design, I don't think so many of them reveal properly like how they collected the data itself. So which is a huge barrier to even verify whether they are doing things right or not. Like was this a random test and how do they do the randomization and all? Anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's certainly interesting, though, to think about, like, if we, cause as more kind of fact-checking rolls out, right, like Twitter, for instance, yes. like, how do we better support people in a fact check or, like, statistical checking, right? Yeah, but we can always use this, like, to ask them to release this data without, mm -hmm. before getting published, because we need yeah. this to verify whether they are doing things right or not. Yeah. So minimum, like, can this be used as a minimum, like, barrier to pass before even... Mm -hmm. Uh, this thing, yeah, just the thought. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions on T? Uh, yeah, I have another question. So, how does T um, make the assertions under the hood about like which tests for the selection? Um. So, which tests for the uh, selection? Yes. So there are, a f so we, in our knowledge base, um, we have a set of constraints that we've already kind of encoded um, based on um, statistical textbooks and research that we've done. Um, and then the kind of end users written program also makes these assumptions, right? Like about groups being normally distributed, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And basically we just compile these higher level statements into these kind of the logical clauses that we've created um, and then uh, try to satisfy as many of these statistical tests as we can. Okay, um, because I was reading uh, and looking at some of your other work before the talk, and I saw that you had mentioned that you used like the MaxSat problem. Oh yeah, so what I just gave you was like a hand wavy version of the algorithm. I'm happy to talk about that with you at, after, at the end of the talk. Okay. Uh, yeah, because it does get into details, but the details are basically like we use an SMT sat solver Z3. Um, and we have these very, we encode these constraints and make a few kind of logical constraint optimizations um, for this process. But yeah. Yeah, great question though. Yes. Yeah, I have one more question, sorry. Hi, Fenway. Hi. Uh, I, I like that you put uh, these uh, most important slides, snapshot uh, together for people to ask a question. So for the left uh, lower slides, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how does T compared to experts? Um, you see that uh, three of these cases, mm -hmm. uh, the selection of T improves the selection Mm -hmm. from the book, right? How do you tell that? How do you evaluate uh, which test is better? Yeah, so our evaluation is based on ex uh, what is uh, explicitly stated, right? So in order for us to kind of assess if an analysis makes sense or is accurate, it's important for authors and uh, analysts to specify what are they assuming about the data or about their analysis procedure. And so kind of given that um, in those three cases, the authors omitted some of these assumptions they were saying. So even the reporting of the analysis was incomplete, right, is, is our kind of interpretation of that. And so then given the fact that it is incomplete, like what we do from based on only what we do know, um, T selects a more conservative alternative, which would uh, make fewer assumptions about uh, the things that the authors have omitted from their reporting of the analysis. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I have one other question. So how yeah. have you been conducting the user studies and what kinds of groups of people have you been looking at for um, working with T and like understanding like how they use the tool? Yeah, so we haven't uh, conducted formal user studies with T. These are a lot of the kinds of um, observations we've made are from people who have either just used T um, so kind of uh, people in the open source community or like one-off people who contact me and then we ask them about it or like people I reach out to sort of colleagues or other people I know who um, are working with data but aren't statistical experts and we are getting more informal kind of experiences to help us kind of develop an understanding of the user experience without doing a formal study um, but we do plan on doing a formal study it was more um, we have done these informal methods more for kind of testing and validating our initial kinds of hunches based on the things we have read in the related work as well as the things we've just like noticed 
um, from our own collaborations and experiences working with data analysis. Um, do you also see tea being used for educational purposes and like teaching students how to like understand statistics and like performing the right kinds of tests? Yeah. So I do think that is a really interesting um, opportunity and application area for tea. And it's something that um, one of the co-authors actually mentioned a while ago. Um, I do think tea is really interesting in that perhaps it could help uh, people learning statistics develop maybe a more robust understanding of what all differentiates these tests and that there's actually really just a core of assumptions about your data that you need to be aware of before testing, figuring out kinds of uh, which tests to use in relation to your hypothesis. Um, I think there are different considerations of using T in an educational purpose. I think with an educational purpose, kind of ex like a lot of explanation and exploration is perhaps necessary. So kind of um, looking into kind of the decision-making process and like what is it actually considering and how do we kind of configure T um, differently depending on our domain or depending on the kinds of assumptions that we uh, agree to be more important than others. Um, and I definitely think in the educational space is also this question of what should the user interaction with something like TB, like through a user interface or some like more interactive kind of like REPL style um, uh, tool. Yeah, uh, to be on time, I request like now we can take the question in the end. Uh, that would be better. Yeah, okay. let's go. Yeah. Thanks, Vivek. So I have um, several more slides about other research at UW, but I'll just kind of quickly go through them. I'm happy to talk about any of these um, at the end um, or just even via email another time. So jumping into kind of other exciting research at UW. So I'm part of two different labs, the Interactive Data Lab, um, as well as the University of Washington's uh, Programming Languages and Software Engineering Group. So I'm just going to start with uh, the Interactive Data Lab or IDL. So here are the brilliant and lovely members of IDL as of March 2020. Um, so the lab is directed by our, our advisor, Jeff Hare. Um, and the mission of our lab is to enhance people's ability to understand and communicate data through the design of new interactive systems for data visualization and analysis. So currently there are kind of two broad areas of research that we've been pursuing. The first is around visualization design and data-driven storytelling. So visualization is really important, not only for kind of understanding about uh, understanding our statistical analyses, but communicating them and developing an intuition for our data and for kinds of insights about domains. Um, and then the second kind of main area of research has been looking at like, ways to support robust end-to-end -end data science. Uh, so I'm just going to mainly focus on the end-to-end -end data science projects, and this will all be very quick just so we can uh, given the limited time, but I'll be focusing on BOBA and Erudite, and they have slightly different um, focuses, uh, foci, foci <laughs> to better support transparency and reproducibility in analyses. So um, BOBA is led by Yang Liu and involves a few other collaborators from, um, from machine learning, HCI, and data viz. Um, and T, uh, although T is focused on identifying the right statistical test to, um, to test one hypothesis, um, the statistical analysis process is often way more involved in, than selecting an appropriate test, right? There are a multitude of decisions that data analysts must make while trying to test hypotheses, like do we exclude this data, how do we bin this data, which model do we make you choose, etc. And so if we consider each analysis that T supports to be a universe, then a data analyst actually explores a multiverse of analyses in their data analysis process. And so multiverse analyses can help increase the transparency of data analyses by communicating all of the possible knobs and choices that a data analyst is explored. So Yang and her collaborators at the bottom of the slide were interested in supporting multiverse analyses, um, but they first needed to answer this question, like how do researchers make analytic decisions? And so um, to understand these analytic decisions, uh, Yang interviewed uh, conducted semi-structured interviews with uh, nine authors of published research studies. And the authors then, or the Yang and her collaborators then developed this graph, the analytic decision graph, um, as seen on the right-hand side for the, uh, each individual interview participant. And so the main thing to kind of take away, I'm not gonna walk through all of the points in this graph as I planned, but the main thing to take away from the analytic decision graph is that it captures sort of the range of questions, um, the range of decisions, as well as the um, many kind of backtracks back and forth between decisions that an analyst must go through before kind of finalizing um, their analysis that's reported in their papers. 
So based on the insights that Yang and her collaborators identified, um, uh, they developed BOBA. Uh, BOBA is an open source system for authoring and visualizing multiverse analyses. So a key challenge for researchers um, in authoring multiverse analyses is that to even author a single universe or a single analysis is difficult, let alone um, multitude, right? And so what they do, what Yang and her collaborators do, is address this issue by developing a domain-specific language, or DSL, for writing multiverse analyses succinctly, as um, you can see on the left-hand side, and then a visual interface for inspecting the multiverse analyses and for identifying what are some of the aggregate properties of all of these universes, and then uh, the ability to probe into each individual universe to gain better understanding. So I was going to give a brief walkthrough, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, skip through it for a time. Um, and the next project I want to talk about and highlight from the Interactive Data Lab um, is one that Sherry Wu leads, and it's called Erudite. So Erudite focuses on supporting error analysis in natural language processing models um, and identifying where NLP models go wrong or identifying and analyzing the errors is important for developing and improving those models. So currently, among uh, some other issues that the authors identify in their paper, error analysis is difficult to conduct at scale and often involves very subjective groupings of errors. So Sherry and her collaborators wanted to make error analysis more precise, uh, reproducible, and scalable. Um, so Erudite provides a domain-specific language and a user interface for error analysis. And so to support user interaction, Erudite also uses this technique called predictive interaction. So let's just imagine we have a task um, such as a visual question answering task where a user might examine sort of different instances within their training set that were incorrectly answered or labeled. So we might formulate an error hypothesis as to why we're seeing these performance errors within our data set. So for example, by looking at these two examples, we might have some hypothesis for how many questions that use adjectives that the model really doesn't understand um, that might be what's undermining the results. So as we can see here in part A, um, we might select text and use predictive interaction techniques to suggest a formal hypothesis that filters the data, um, for example, to find how many adjectives as part of the pattern within the natural text. Uh, in doing so, then we can learn more formal hypotheses that, ra um, that rather than looking at just a sample of errors, we can actually run them across the entirety of our data and use them to compare various models um, to know how performance changes for different hypotheses and different models. So this can give us very useful and descriptive data for starting to assess and figure out ways to improve our models. Um, however, this still falls one step short of actually being able to test some of the hypotheses or to assess, does the inclusion of an adjective really make the model worse or better? So um, we can fill this gap by authoring rewrite rules, again, through predictive interactions, so like suggesting opportunities for rewriting the rules, and by editing one piece of text, Erudite can then choose, uh, can then show how it can change the input and generalize um, from, from that example and input to learn rules that can rewrite the data systematically um, and see if model prediction shifts over time. So just the key idea here is to kind of formulate and represent error hypotheses and model them to better understand where our models are going wrong and improve them as well as to provide uh, users opportunities to interact and to refine this error analysis and error hypothesis, hypothesis formation process. Uh, I have a question. So these rules are written like by DSL is written, uh, is made beforehand. So like start with uh, all these kind of yeah. rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, on the right side, you have this all instances. These are the statistical uh, relation yes. between the rules and the data. Like all instances, what is this? All instances, uh, one, two, one, five, two. Oh, these are all different kinds of, um, uh, I think they're different, I might use the term queries or these. Uh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, I I'm, can talk a little bit more details, but. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I, it's more of like an overview picture, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that just covers um, Boba and Erudite are just very, um, some of the couple of other projects that uh, people in the Interactive Data Lab are doing. And so now I just want us to kind of shift our attention quickly, quickly to the University of Washington's PL group or Pulse. So Pulse is a very vibrant group. There are many different kinds of research going on, including verification, program synthesis, fabrication, and data science. 
And one particular project I'd like to highlight is led by Chen Long Wang. So Chen Long was really interested in supporting end users who may not necessarily want to write all the nitty gritty visualization code, like in ggplot or matplotlib, for instance. And so he wants to support automatically inferring data visualizations based on one user demonstration of the visualization task. So kind of the example here is that, let's say I have a, um, a data set of products across and how they perform, or how many sell across the quarters of a year for a few years. Um, the end user often has this idea of like, I want to communicate this, uh, the trends in my data by showing some kind of visualization here being a heat map. Um, and so what Falk's Chen Long's tool does is it takes an end user's demonstration. So visualizing just these three different points. So how are these three points related to the data set? And then Fox will synthesize um, and provide as output these uh, full visualizations uh, shown here. So what Falx is doing behind the scenes is basically synthesizing a data preparation script. So how do we wrangle and tra transform and manipulate the existing data set um, into something that's usable for visualization. And then it also synthesizes a visualization script that um, actually uses Vega Light under the hood uh, to visualize the end product. So the idea here is I want, to, if the end user wants to kind of quickly uh, visualize um, their data in a way that they already know, rather than asking them to go ahead and implement it through code, whether it's an R or Python or whatever else they use, can we just allow them to more directly express and demonstrate the visualization they want to create? Especially if, um, oft especially because oftentimes these visualizations are supporting a more interactive and iterative loop of data analysis and understanding. Um, so that's this, very, this is very similar to flash fill features uh, yes. in MSR. I, I see there is a correlation between these. Anyway. Yeah, there is. I, they both are using program synthesis a little ahead, right? Yes. I mean, yes, is demonstrate like by example. So if right. you just give few examples to generate, do yeah. the wrangling work kind of. Yeah. Here yeah. you are doing visualization. Interesting. Yeah, so it's a sort of like a different application, right, in this space yes. of working with data. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so just as you've seen through a few of the examples from IDL and UW Pulse, uh, data science does require and incorporate a large number of perspectives and approaches from different domains. Um, for end user tools in particular, they often require a growing understanding of how people like to work with data and how we can better support them for a wide range of users. Um, so with that, I just want to kind of reiterate and emphasize that data science is a really exciting and interesting area of research that requires many different perspectives and techniques um, from computer science and beyond. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thanks Vinis, and I really enjoyed your talk. Anybody has questions? We have time, we can extend till 1.15, it's okay. If anybody has any questions. <laughs> People already asked <laughs> questions. Oh, uh... <laughs> Oh, okay. Brandon, go ahead. So are you working on like any visualization related work in addition to T? Uh, so the work I've been doing uh, with visualization, one kind of project um, is around kind of improving T uh, output perhaps um, okay. through visualization. The second is I'm actually collaborating with Chen Long um, on uh, we're still in this phases of kind of scoping this project, but it's basically kind of around like how do we better support people in quickly analyzing and visualizing their data um, for data that's really messy. And so rather than a kind of slightly similar to Falks in the sense that we want to just have an end user provide one demonstration, but the tricky thing here we're trying to figure out of how to address is um, how do we maybe get that information or support that um, during analysis too, so that you don't have to do analysis separate from visualization. Oh, okay. interesting. So I want to thank again, Ines and everybody who attended the talk. I hope we learned a lot and obviously you can contact uh, us again uh, offline and ask questions or if you want to collaborate or something, please yeah. feel, I, I think, feel free to contact her and thanks for giving this talk and engaging us. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for listening and sticking around. Um, happy to talk anytime. Yeah, we can do the virtual cap. <laughs> <laughs>
which is <laughs> we cannot do <laughs> the physical class <laughs> but yeah <laughs> so yeah uh, okay so thank you thanks i will share the feedback if i receive from anybody so i have created a feedback form also that's great about the talk so yeah. uh, this is just a routine i'm following so that speaker also get something more out of the talk just not delivering so if they okay. want to present it somewhere else also if they so that would be okay yeah. thanks thanks thank everyone you. thank you bye bye, bye. bye. take care